Cameron, tell the potato story because it's such a, a fascinating... Well, I mean, it's a, it is a very fascinating one. I think um, in Peru, in my understanding, they have about 420 different varieties of potato. Um, we pay them to, I think, grow commercially about four of those, which they do for the rest of the world, and they think we're crazy because they're the ones that we want, and then they keep all the others for themselves. <laughs> and they eat all these fantastic different varieties of potato in Peru, but it's not commercial. And it's, it comes back, as you said, Angela, you know, what is the perfect size? What's the perfect shape? What, what is going to be the most aesthetically pleasing to the consumer? And, you know, the, the, the potato is one of the most biodiverse things, but most people would have no idea they think a potato is a potato. And the reality is with all of these things we're talking about, there's so many varieties. And I think you mentioned before, Philip, about wine. Mm. I think people begin to get an understanding of different types of grapes and where they're grown, the different soil. People, and it's the same. You, get, you start getting into coffee. You start getting into chocolate. You start getting any of these things. And there's so many different varieties and flavours that come with how it's grown, where it's grown, sides of hills, different varieties. You know, and as people... I think as people uh, pay more attention to what they're putting into their bodies and they pay more attention to what they're buying, it's an amazing adventure of, wow, look at all this fantastic stuff that's available to us. My We're suspicion right. is that this is actually the problem with GM. There's a lot of fear about the health and environmental consequences of GM, yeah. which are largely unknown. Uh, there's this commercial recklessness to get these products to market without knowing those things. But I think perhaps the real problem is the socio-political side of things, the concentration of ownership of seed varieties in fewer and fewer hands. Mm -hmm. There's these few very large seed companies that own, own the commercial varieties, and there are fewer and fewer of them. I mean, like the potato famine in Ireland, apparently it was because they're growing the same, the same species, the same yeah. variety, yeah. Yeah. and so a disease hit that variety, and instead of them growing 20 different varieties and only affected that one, it wiped out the entire crop. Um, and we could be facing that sort of problem ourselves. I can half remember a program we did about the perils of the banana to bring it back to Queensland. The banana is in long-term trouble, is it not? Yeah, it certainly is. I think uh, in the United States they're talking about, you know, we're not going to have bananas to eat in the United States within a certain amount of time. Something's happening with the, um, the spread of disease on the certain... on the ones that they bring in, but also because they have homogenised the type of bananas that they bring into the United States and that they grow and that are sold, and that's the one that's susceptible to this disease. Because they have narrow diversity, now they're potentially going to not be able to eat bananas anymore. Well, I'm going to go and climb that bridge like everyone else and jump off it shortly, but uh, <laughs> before that, perhaps someone... We've still got bananas here. <laughs> no. Dear audience, there are microphones available, and uh, start interrogating... My distinguished panel, if you please. Um, yes, uh, I was just thinking that uh, you, you were blaming the uh, customer for not making the right choice, in other words, supporting the, the industries as they should. Uh, but, uh, but I believe it's not only the customer, I believe the monopolists uh, that control, and, and we just take the three uh, grocers, if you like, who've got something like 80% of the total The duopoly, trade. yes. Well, they actually are controlling what they're going to put on the market. What do you people say? Um, I think it's very easy to say, well, they control the food market, but if people choose to give them their money, they control the food market. They do the you know, marketing. They tell you what Yeah... Say. You know, you can vote for the kind of world you want every day. You don't have to wait till the ballot box. You can vote three times a day, in fact, mm -hmm. with what you choose to put in your mouth. You can vote with every dollar you spend for the kind of world you want. Like, McDonald's as a corporation might annoy me to the ends of the earth, but people want to give them their money. They and McDonald's be... are responding to community pressure yeah, to try and lift their way. game yeah. and uh, try to be better citizens. I, incidentally, I hate to tell you this, but years and years ago I discovered that the woman who owned McDonald's through a series of family deaths was in fact a huge supporter of the US Democrats and gave money to all sorts of left-wing causes. I hate telling you that, but I thought you ought to know. <laughs> this gentleman with the sunglasses on his head... <laughs> Uh, I wanted to make a statement to something that Cameron said and then to invite comment on that. And I actually raised this at Greenfest last year as well, that you mentioned about the markets and, and the creation of markets. So I've been involved in marketing in health and sustainability for the last 15 years. So I'm one of those people who actually creates markets for things. 
And when I look at the organic market um, from an insider's view, it seems to be that there's a real lack of critical analysis uh, around product development within that market itself. But the latest research that's coming out of the States is saying that consumers aren't so much concerned about greenwashing as they are thoroughly exhausted with the plethora of claims around sustainability um, and, and organics as well. And so the latest product that I've seen is, is organic smoked uh, Tasmanian salmon shrink wrapped on a foil wrap, uh, foil backed piece of cardboard being shipped off all around Australia and it's BFA certified. Now, if that's not the antithesis of organics, I don't know what is, and yet somehow these products make it through the certification process. So, that, so the question that I want to throw open to you is how do we introduce a far more rigorous level of analysis because consumers aren't stupid um, and they are exhausted of conflicting claims. I thank you for this. I think these are the sort of hard questions to which the organic industry must respond. Who'd like to have a crack at that? <laughs> <Start on that. laughs> um, well, I, I think that organic isn't the be-all and end-all. There's lots of other forms of like local farms that uh, are using smaller amounts of pesticides and doing the right thing and living, uh, producing food sustainably. So, and then you can get to the thing of do you purchase an organic food that's been shipped from, you know, or flown from halfway across the world, or do you buy the same product that's local and not organic? And I think that it's preferable to go with the local product because that has had a lot less emissions in its creation. Um, it's, it's had a lot smaller impact on the environment. So, yes, it is complicated and there are a lot of different issues that you need to weigh up. And I think we it all need might to be getting to the point where we need to have stars like they do on <laughs> electrical appliances, <laughs> a summary of the inputs. And, uh, yeah, yeah and we need to ask questions. They've been talking about that in the UK now for a while, about trying to come up with a carbon footprint mm -hmm. logo on products. It's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Like New Zealand lamb did an analysis of the carbon footprint of New Zealand lamb, frozen New Zealand lamb in the UK, versus the carbon footprint of locally produced lamb, and it was lower mm. for the New Zealand one, mm. even having come for all the way from New Zealand. That's so the thing. Like, um, it's about systems of production, and it's about, you know, you get, if you get caught up in just looking at carbon as well, it, you, you get distracted by a whole range of different things. And I think, you know, this begins to delve into the issues of how complex this thing is and how, and how people... Not, need not be discouraged if they're encouraged to begin to make better choices, whether no, even if it's not the best choice, and certainly working with businesses as I do in responding to what you're talking about, it's a journey for them as well. Like, you know, they're beginning to do something better and then they do something more and they do something more. Like, I don't think we can expect the whole food system and retail of food and everything else to change very quickly um, and certainly not immediately. What, what I'm saying is that more and more businesses and business people are paying attention to these issues and they are thinking about how do they communicate that to consumers and bring consumers with them. How do you begin to connect up issues of local systems of production with you know, uh, issues of organic and carbon footprints. And you do run the risk. One of the companies I'm working with, you know, they've got ACO certification, they've got fair trade certification, they've now got carbon zero, you know, so they're, you know, they're now, you know, carbon neutral in what they do. So they're going to carry three certifications at least on their packaging. And it becomes some competition of, you know, who can cover their coffee with as many different certifications as possible. <laughs> but, you know, like each of those things, people, people in this room, some people will want to make choices about local. Some people want to make choices about the eco message. Some people want to make choices about the ethical message. And people do differ and have a different hierarchy of the things that they choose and the things that they see as important. Mm -hmm. And so while Angela's saying she would probably buy, you know, the, the local option, it gets more, if, you know, if, you're, if I'm talking about um, garments, I'm definitely probably, unless there's some very good reason for it, I'm not going to buy local because I know it's going to be, you know, it's, well, I well, also know it's going to be um, through exploitative labour in Australia, because that's, uh, stuff that's made in Australia, even if it's garments, is exploitative. And so we've, it we've, gets far sorry. more complicated. We've heard from the dangerous left-wingers in the audience. Are there anyone on the right who's <laughs> a right-winger? Sir, I try to get it Just for before it. we move on, further to that comment, I think I like Michael Pollan's uh, suggestion. Michael Pollan's an American journalist who wrote a book. He's terrific. Yeah, he's wrote a book... Um, 
uh, in defence of food, and he said, uh, "Eat food." Okay, and while that uh, is a very simple message, it's very increasingly hard to to comply with because a lot of what we're offered isn't food; it's edible food-like substances. And what he said was, <laughs> "Avoid products that make health claims." Because health claims are a sure sign that it's probably not food. It's just dressed up to make you think that it is. And it'll... So, so, you know, you're talking about a, a shrink-wrapped, um, foil-backed package from, you know, smoked and, and sent from Tasmania. For God's sake, eat a fish. You know, eat, and his, so his advice is just eat food in as near to as natural state as you can. Can we all agree to eat food here today? <laughs> all those in favour? <laughs> right, OK. We won that argument. A right-winger, please. Here's Ron. Yeah. Um, we've been blessed with a saying just recently, saying every family needs a farmer. The obvious question that lies in with that, that every farmer needs water. Water's got off the agenda. Would you like to make a comment, each of them? Look, I happen, I'm going to make a comment. We've had almost a decade of drought, and boy, have we learned to value water. You know, every, we, 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 we know every drop by name now. <laughs> and, the, and the profligacy. You know, it's, you, know you, didn't, you weren't aware how much you wasted it until you didn't get it. Now, this year, we've got grass up to your kyber, and for the first time, we can't even see the few remaining cattle we've got or the feral animals. But it's a storm before the lull. We'll be back in drought by Christmas. And I think that's already happened in Australia. Everyone in the agricultural industries has had one hell of a fright. And there is an awareness, I think, a greater awareness, my read of it, that uh, the good days are over, not just temporarily, but forever. And we're going to have to rethink every drop of water. Mm. Am I being overly optimistic? <laughs> I, about pessimism? <laughs> I read a statistic recently, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like a gazillion megalitres of water that we export every year. Yeah. In our exports, in our beef Perhaps. exports and in our crop exports, the, the embedded water in those yeah, Even in our potatoes. Enormous. Yeah, yeah. Enormous. So we obviously don't value our... our and th water. This is where I think um, some of the issues about... Um, local food production and what we consume and overseas imports begins to come into play. One of the conversations I had recently was Cam Walker from Friends of the Earth and he got himself in a lot of trouble because he said, suggested that um, growing rice in Australia is a pretty <laughs> crazy idea given the amount of water that we don't have. I got in trouble for saying that too. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, he suggested we sh what we probably should be doing is looking at buying fair trade rice out of you know, communities in our near region which have adequate water to grow rice. And obviously the Rice Growers Association of Australia didn't particularly like that suggestion. But if you, if you look across a whole range of things, there may be cases where you can actually say, well, we don't do that that well here. We don't have the right environment for that. If we do want to eat rice, and maybe we just don't, but if you do want it, then maybe it's not grown locally. Maybe it is grown in local food systems under fair trade conditions in our near region. Yeah. So, you know, some of these things, I think, you know, begin to show that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach here. What we're, what we're trying to get to is more like food systems that are re restoring you know, eco and people to them that we can um, touch and that we can have some connection with. Oh, sorry, sir. We, the Western world, have, have actually uh, um, brought the third world countries into supplying us with food and we can't turn around and say, now we're all going to shop locally. I mean, that's completely unethical. So I wanted to ask uh, Cameron and other members of the audience, how do we actually go about transitioning them back to their uh, subsistence agriculture. The um, questions are too good here. I've never, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard such interesting questions. Come on, I you Sure, I mean, uh, I, think, I think there's de a definite ethical, uh, ethical thing at play there. I mean, for us to all of a sudden go, we've created this problem, uh, our Western way of living has put the planet in peril, um, it's not your fault. You've done nothing to contribute to it because you know you're, you've you've never owned a television, you've never driven a car, you haven't contributed anything to this problem that we're now facing. Um, so we're going to stop buying from you now and let you just leave you to yourself, and uh, we'll go and try and figure it out. There's an inherent problem with that, and certainly that's the message that we hear from you know farmers in Kenya and PNG and stuff. They're kind of like, this is not our problem. We did not create this. You did. 
don't blame us and take it out on us now that you've realised you know you need to fix these things up. You know, and you know, and I think you know there's there's definite um, challenges with that because we do. I think there's a definite case for. Um, Buying local and relocalisation, if it's done under those same kind of principles of you know environmental performance and economic ju economic justice, social justice. But at the same time, I think you know we have a responsibility, particular as Australians in our region, to you know what we want to develop from a fair trade perspective is that there's more fair trade coming into Australia and New Zealand from East Timor, from PNG, from the Solomons, from you know, from the communities close to us that we can have a relationship with and that we can continue to trade with. We're not in any way suggesting that we should be abandoning them. But you know, I think I think the realities of uh, how transport is going to be affected and cost in the future are going to mean that Perhaps buying coffee out of Africa will become a luxury, but buying you know coffee out of East Timor might be still perfectly reasonable. So you know, I think I think those issues are definitely in play. But I think you're right. I don't think I think it's a pretty unethical and immoral kind of position to all of a sudden say, "Sorry, we've screwed up, and now we're going to abandon." Well, Comrade Heaton, before you speak, I've got to identify the program. It's LNL on ABC Radio National, etc., 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 and it's coming to you from the Ideas Festival in Brisbane. Shane Heaton, your response. Um, further to that, on the the fair trade and the flying stuff around the world, the shipping. UK shipping stuff around the world, the UK organic movement has been really struggling with this over the last few years because they were flying in um, certified organic snow peas from Kenya. And, um, and, you know, the, the embodied energy in doing that is crazy. Um, and they, the Soil Association, the main certifier there, um, did an exhaustive consultation on what to do about this. And they decided in the end that they would continue to certify those products for sale in the UK. But the carbon had to be offset from the flights to get the product in. There had to be programs on the ground in the, in the country of origin to develop a local market. Um, that, that there were programs in place to, to justify that. So, And is that happening? Yeah, yeah. Angela? Um, yeah, I think there's also products that we can't grow in Australia, things like cocoa, and I don't think we could possibly grow enough coffee to satisfy our coffee addiction. <laughs> so this gives us an opportunity to fairly trade with countries that do need, um, need our trade. Oh, look, so many hands. One from over here, left winger. Um, I just wanted to... No one's um, really touched on meat and I was wondering about how many of the panellists and even audience members, as people who are obviously concerned about the ethics of eating, are vegetarians or have some degree of, of restrictions on the amount of meat that they oh, eat. Oh, I knew this would come up. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't raise it. Um, but, and, and, you know, are, there, are the arguments convincing enough that we need to, as a society, move more and more towards eating less and less meat, and fishing industries are even being overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay, Angela, your first cup off the rank. Absolutely. That is one of the biggest things I think we can all do uh, to combat climate change, certainly, is eat less meat. Um, it is the biggest... I can see the meat board taking that up as a slogan. <laughs> oh, they, they've already been on my case as well. Less meat. It's, I love it. Yeah, they don't like me either. Um, but... You know, the, the UN has said that 18% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock industry. So it is a huge contributor to um, our environmental problems. And we actually eat five times more meat than we did in 1950. Is that right? Yeah, it's just wow. incredible. Because it used to be a luxury, and now it's kind of once a day or twice a day people eat meat. So one of the biggest things we can all do is eat a lot less meat. One of the issues with that too, I think, is it's not just that we eat meat, it's that as um, countries in transition and as mm -hmm. consuming classes are growing in a lot of these developing countries like China and India, they're copying us. Yeah, and so part of being a, affluent a of, is yeah, that they are going to eat meat now too. Mm -hmm. And so because, because we do. So yeah. like if we have expectations about... Uh, climate change reduction and you know all those kinds of things, then we kind of have to model it first because mm. they're, they're uh, copying yeah, us. Absolutely. We're trying to even outdo us. At, at the current rate, global meat production is set to double mm. by, 19, uh, by 2050, and that's pretty scary. As someone who produces some beef, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I want you all to know that we're trying to teach our cattle better table manners. <laughs> Sir, your turn. 
Vegetarianism or just eating less meat? I'm mostly vegan, um, and I would advocate that. Um, I think... That's why you look so sickly. And... I think... <laughs> <laughs> healthy looking bugger, healthy looking fella. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think you need to be a vegan or pure vegetarian or vegetarian seven days a week um, to make a difference. Um, I've, I've, I've written various books on nutrition and I've got one in the, in the pipeline called The Part-Time Vegetarian. And while that may sound hypocritical, um, it's actually what we need most people to do. Um, the... the uh, White House is going to have one meat-free meal a week, I read this morning. And, um, and, that, uh, it, and, and they're encouraging Americans to do that. And if every American house had one meat-free meal uh, dinner a week... It I would, would have be, thought that re would be regarded as blasphemy in America. It, it's the equivalent of taking 20 million cars off the road for a year. Is that That's right? Huge impact. How many, That's just, just one just meal a week. A quick poll. <laughs> How many people here are vegetarians? Wow. That is amazing. <laughs> that is vegans. The, the people who are listening to this on radio, <laughs> you would not believe what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a very large audience, and there, ninety percent of them seem to be vegetarians. No, it's about half. Don't. <laughs> I demand a recap. I demand a recap. Vegetarians and vegans, up, hands up. Thank you. Yeah, it's close mm. to 15. Perhaps it's as a beef producer, I just found that terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a gross, it's a gross waste of resources, basically. It takes yeah. enormous amount of water. We're putting your hands up. Water. No. <laughs> um, and the thing about China and India eating more meat, it drove the price of grain through the roof last year. There were food riots in various places around the world because people couldn't get access to grain. They, they couldn't get corn for tortillas in Mexico. They couldn't get grain in Africa. Did you know even in 1985, this fascinates me, during Live Aid, Ethiopia was exporting grain to Europe for animal feed. And not a lot of people know that. Mm. So, you know, animal production is a gross waste yeah. of resources. We have neglected the people up the back of the audience. There's a couple of meat eaters there I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to encourage. <laughs> I've got a comment and a question. The first comment is um, just on the vegetarian meat issue and also the water shortage issue. And these stats come straight from the Vegan Society UK website, so I hope they're right. But um, they're actually saying that for a day's worth of intake for a meat eater, that takes 15,000 litres of water. For a day's worth of intake for a vegetarian, 5,000 litres of water to produce that food, and for a vegan, 2,500 litres of water. Mm -hmm. So never mind your water-saving sort of shower headsets. Let's look at what we're actually eating. Um, and then when we are... I'm not actually advocating a meat-free diet, um, but when we are choosing our meat sources, looking at eco-sources of meat, so one of the solutions is looking at kangaroo, um, mm -hmm. because it's, it, kangaroos don't actually produce methane, um, and they don't take a lot of water, they're not generally farmed. They're terribly hard to muster, I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> just That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you just need a good shotgun, I've heard. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's fantastic, and, and definitely dairy as well is a very high water usage, so that's why a vegan has such a, a low impact. Um, but... I think it's a, you know, I don't think everybody's going to stop eating meat and becoming a vegan. But if they do, when they do eat meat, if they eat a sustainable meat such as kangaroo, or they eat biodynamic beef such as Philip grows, <laughs> or, or <laughs> creates, <laughs> and and to eat, yeah, quality that has been uh, sustainably produced and eat it a lot less. Let's ring Kevin after this and have a meat-free day at the lodge <laughs> every week and another one at Kirribilli House. Get onto the GG. Less meat at Yarra Alumni. We've just about got the problem tossed, I think. <laughs> There's another question up the back. Sir? Are there barriers politically to people like you who are leaders in a new area? Are there barriers of, of change in you taking strong steps and galvanising great? There's, 
<laughs> There's a lot of lobby groups and a lot of very powerful industries that uh, make a lot of money, as, as Cameron said, that do pr push barriers and um, don't want us to talk about these issues as much as we should. This change is not easy. It's not easy to turn an oil tanker around that's going at full speed, and that's what we're trying to do with changing the food system. Um, there are a lot of vested interests that don't want there to be any change. The, the, I noticed in the UK when I was involved in the organic movement there for 10 years that the thing that grew as fast as um, the organic market were criticisms of organics mm. regularly appearing in the media. And we haven't had a lot of it here, but there has been some. It's been mm. uh, a regular thing, criticisms of organics in the media saying it's a waste of money and it's bad for you and it won't feed the world. But... Um, you know, that's because people don't. There are there are vested interests, commercial interests out there that don't want there to be change. And I think you know, it's um, it is all of these issues we're talking about. Whether we're talking about local, we're talking about organic, we're talking about fair trade. And you know, Judy Wick brought all she brings all those things together. Is you know, it is about a food politics. And I think you know, coming back to what Shane was saying, like we, it, it is a vote. And I think you know, as the markets for these things grow, business business will lead before governments will in terms of making changes, in terms of how they operate, and we're giving them licence to change the way they're doing. And, you know, the big bad retailers giving more shelf space to more of these kinds of products. Um, but, you know, I think we, we, we need... We need, to, we need to make change in our own lives, but we, we need to be having the, the broader conversations with businesses, with suppliers, you know, encouraging them. People, people in these businesses are our friends and colleagues, and they have families too. So you know, let's talk to them and bring those along with us. And I think as you build those kinds of things, the politicians have to, at some point, pay attention. It's, it's not an easy sell for them at the moment. I don't think there's any votes in it. OK, you can have one final word, Shane, before I've got to wind the thing up. Just to expand on my consumer bashing earlier, um, you only have to look at how people spend money. You look at Australian Bureau of Statistics household spending data from 2000. We spend more, the average Australian household every week spends more on alcohol than they do on fruit and veg, more on junk food than they do on fruit That's and veg. That's because they're all so depressed. More on, ta <laughs> more, on, more on takeaways than they do on fruit and veg. The, the games console and games industry in Australia last year was $2 billion. The organic industry was about $400 million. You know, it's just wow. not true. We were 23 million. Yeah. So it's just not true that people don't have the money to spend on better quality food that has more ethical um, uh, parameters. Um, it's about choices that we make. You know, about 10 years ago, I came up to Brisbane and talked to Jim Sawley, who was then the mayor, and I forget who was the premier that week, and, <laughs> and, and sold them the idea of a festival of ideas. And what has been my reward? An attack on the poor beef producers. <laughs> but I have to say, this has been one of the most interesting sessions I've ever attended. A dangerously well-informed audience. And I'd like this dangerously well-informed audience to uh, applaud Angela Crocombe, Shane Heaton and Cameron Neal. <laughs> <laughs>